Hi, welcome to Game Analyze. This is my first video here. I'm Auna. Today I'll be talking about level design. We'll talk about 2D and 3D level design with various examples and different approaches for different genres. So let's analyze. The first example will be a fairly old game, Skylanders Dance. We'll talk about its first level. Keep in mind this is a 3D combat game with fairly linear levels and some exploration and backtracking. We'll also talk a bit about each game's mechanics, not all of them, but only to give more context. So let's start. First, you watch a little cutscene and put your Skylander in the portal. This is an image of the first view you get. You're in a small field, no enemies whatsoever and the linear path. As a new player, your first move will be, well, moving. So you can move a bit in your field and probably notice this incredibly obvious fall to work and try to break it. This is only possible with a giant, but as we all know, when you have a new game and one of the figures is absolutely enormous, you will probably try to use a giant first. Great, you just learned how to attack. Behind the wall, there's a collectible, which you obviously collect, wanting to know what it is, and you get told nothing. This is a clever but strange way of doing collectibles, as you can make the player want to know what it is, but maybe some players won't like that you don't tell them what you are giving them. Anyway, let's summarize this first part. Name the forgotten path. First, you learn how to move, then you discover how to attack. And finally, you get some mysterious collectible you didn't know existed and don't know its purpose. Good, let's go. You then get your usual tutorial for attacking and see a cannon and learn how to use it. Learning the action button is it. Then your component with turtle, your first ever little puzzle. See, this turtle lets you get this test. So you learn what chests are and acknowledge that there will be more puzzles ahead. And after all this, you get your first enemy. You can either battle them normally or stomp them as a giant. You see, giant skylanders can kill small creatures just by stomping them. Jump this enter this category. After that, you are taught giant's mechanics. But first, you get a soul gem. This is your third collectible, and it forces you to use your new lord mechanic, giant boulders. Then you learn a new mechanic, and when using it, realize you left something. This scroll is really important, as it is a collectible that also shows you how to get other collectibles. It teaches you that you'll be replaying the levels too. Now, you get a chest and learn that chests and doors meet all enemy skills before opening. You meet a new enemy and you use bounce pad to reach here. Now, to the right, there's a secret passageway to the place to just the world. There's not really anything. But if you fall down there, you get jumpies again, and if you do it a third time, you get a secret collectible you otherwise couldn't get. This is taught in the next level, in one of those scrolls, and gives your game a lot of replay value and fresh content. This is why I said 
scrolls are very important. You enforce exploring and replaying. To be honest, when I first played the game, I didn't even know these collectibles existed. Anyway, after that, there's a zone you can only access with some Skylanders. And this one in particular can be accessed with your starter pack. You there meet a new enemy and another collectible. Then another of these elemental zones and you start the Conquertron battle. In it, you get chased by the Conquertron, but there's a catch. No matter how slow you are, he never gets you. This makes all kinds of players think they are in danger and feel good after escaping him. Also, there's an elemental zone only the best can spot, following this path, and another collectible here. After that, you're done. Let's summarize the level. You are taught exploration and replayability. You discover every type of collectible, meet three types of enemies, see almost every mechanic and feel nice beating a massive robot independently of your skill level. All of this takes about half an hour collecting everything and about 15 minutes for an average playthrough. Wow! Let's see what we can learn from it. 1. Not knowing what a collectible serves as can build intrigue for the next level. 2. Uncovering secrets later in the game adds freshness and replay value. 3. Showing everything in one level can excite a player to continue playing. And 4. Do less casting and more interactive events, like the boss battle. Lastly, 5. You can engage players with challenges that adapt to their skill level. Right, that's a lot of information, but it's really useful. To finish, let's comment the real level design. It takes about 15 minutes, as we said, to cross all the map. The level is linear, but it uses paths that diverge from the main one to hide secrets. As we said, schools tell you how to get more treasure, usually using small details and visual clues, as we see in this image. The level also tells a story about some rock miners that are helped by a Skylander, and the big boss arena is made in a circle to focus on the boss, so it's obvious there's something important there. The level escalates with paths and rooms, where you first are in a field which shows calm and peace, then you enter the mine which starts to build tension, and the last the big arena has a focal point that is enormous and intimidates you. The color scheme is very much the same, and really the player goes from one room to the other to discover all the levels in. As we see, this level has some interesting mechanics and bits we all should learn about. And now we'll move on to 2D Metroidvania games. This is Hollow Knight. We'll talk about Green Path. This is almost at the start of the game. It's very early game and is just left of the Forgotten Crossroads. This is a map of all the things there are there. You can see, obviously, one linear path, this one. In this place, you battle with Hornet, a very difficult battle for this early game. There's not much to say about the mechanics of the game. This is a fairly simple game, it has no main mechanics. It's just combat, then you have your collectibles, as to say, it's the powers you get. And you finally have the charms, which give you additional powers, but don't affect really the game in itself. The first thing you see about this place is, well, 
the change of the color. You first have in Forgotten Crossroads a really dark theme. And then, when you enter Green Path, you have a fairly greenery and alive feeling. This makes you feel a change in the game with a visual clue, which is the change of color. This is very important, as it makes the player feel an advancement, feel progress in the game. You should always do this. And you can even see this in games like Super Hexagon, where there's no levels, it's just, well, Hexagon. And as you can see, it changes bit by bit the color. So you always see a change, and you always get feedback. As it is a very early game part, you can obviously see that you get pulled by the hand and the developers are guiding you a bit. Then you get just thrown in the map and you can do almost whatever you want. But in Green Path, you will be following a fairly linear map for now. So we can see that Hornet always is guiding you. This is just to players not to distract exploring everything and just to get lost you always have Hornet there trying to guide you to control where you are going as I said in this part you'll be following a fairly linear path Hornet always guides you to the left and well you bit by bit go following her when you get to the arena, you fight with her, win, and you get the dashing ability and unlock all the green path zones. This is very interesting because now you get a practice part for the dash, and then you get to well explore everything, and that is impressive because. A full map is very big and this is just a little part and you get to explore everything and with the dash you can see this is everything you can explore it is enormous you can explore almost every part in the game and there are parts that you don't even need the dash to explore but it's easier with the dash that is using very professional speedrun to skip some power-ups it's interesting how all the game is made to not control you but to let you free and you don't even need to use every ability you can even not see any ability at all and almost see every part of the game it's really, really interesting. Green Path has a very strange map. It's very, very stretched and has very little explorated parts or parts you can explore. But one of the mechanics of Hollow Knight, which makes exploration very, very important, is you can see there's a path, but you cannot access it until you enter it. You cannot see what there is there until you go there and explore it. That forces you to see what there is. And you cannot do anything with the map until you explore the parts you want to know. You also get this light in every door that by makes you want to go there makes you feel safety going to the light okay so that was Hollow Knight what did we learn from it? well first the color palette gives a continuity and progress feeling to the player feedback of their actions 
two, use what's usually called a weenie, important thing that catches your attention, like hornet in this case, to guide your player. Three, give always something after a boss fight or some important challenge that solves a problem you didn't know existed, like the dash in this case, which helps the player to go to places they didn't know they could get and pass some obstacles without any problem. 4. Create a faster route after players have beaten the level, so it doesn't get boring. When you complete a level, navigating it again will get boring for a player, so if you get a faster route, it will be so much better. It will help players not feel bored going from one place to another again and again. You will create a much faster flow. 5. Leave blank spaces in your map to guide players to go and explore them. If you leave a blank space in your map, players will naturally need to know what is there and try to go there to find out. 6. Even linear levels can be then made open and be given a totally different feeling, like we see in this case. You first start going through a linear route that you really cannot avoid, but then when you complete it, you can go wherever you want, making the level completely different. 7. You don't always need a tutorial for enemies, just let the player fight them. They will find out how to beat an enemy and get more conscious about them if you don't show them a special way of doing it, but leave them freely to find a method they like. And finally, 8. Fill hollow spaces with little enemies. Interesting architecture and little secret. If you fill your level in some interesting way, just no need of doing a reward in every way. You just need to fill the map. It won't feel empty, it will feel alive. And that is very important. With this, we can see the next level. Celeste's old side. Celeste is a game about a little girl, Medellin, that climbs a dangerous mountain, avoiding spikes and even herself. It's a 2D platformer with no attack or defense system, with fairly linear levels which are connected to a hub which corresponds to the start of the area. Old side is the second chapter so you are still learning to maneuver properly. One of my first examples will be how the use of these dark thingies changes with this mirror, as they first serve as your usual platform, and when you reach the mirror, they will change to a blobby block that keeps your momentum when you pass through them. What I just mentioned is almost all of the levels lore, after that, you escape your backside and call through a phone. You sometimes use the mechanical platforms from the previous level, but it's almost all based around the new mechanic. I can't physically show every part of the stage, and there's a lot to see, so let's start. As I said, it's based around the new mechanic, so the design reinforces it. They first show you the block, then change them to the new form, so you not only see the change, but feel it as you return to the original half. As we said with Hollow Knight, visual changes reinforce the feeling of progress. In this case, the change only happens in the dark blocks, but you also see it in the dash, as Madeline's hair turns blue in the switches to open doors and other small visual reinforcements. In the select level design GDC, it is mentioned that they think 
every screen tells a story, so they focus on it. You can see this in one of the images shown, where they tweak the level so it focuses in the jump from the ice block to the platform, not in the jump to get to the ice block itself, and to focus players not to skip stuff. Obviously, there's more, but it can't be here. Now, let's look at the lessons in it. First, visual reinforcement to show progress can be done in small things, not only in the whole level or color palette. Two, refresh the level by tweaking a mechanic or changing it completely, so you create almost a completely new level, like the blocks in this case. 3. If you base around the mechanic, the levels will be easier to think of and impress the player with things or uses of mechanics he didn't think about. 4. If you focus on a particular part, whether it's a jump, tight timing, or just a peaceful walk, you can adjust your level to naturally lead to this point. 5. Hide secrets everywhere so anyone can get them, but hide the best ones to the smartest or most skilled player, such as the crystal heart. 6. Mechanics can be used as lore, as we see in these dark blocks, which don't really have any context or text attached to it, but serve as a level center point anyway, serving as a story part and as a mechanic. 7. Some secrets, like this strawberry, can be hidden not in a malicious or difficult to dig way, but so only the most curious can find it. And now, we go through to Mario Odyssey. Now, Mario Odyssey is a 3D open world game, where every open world is a small level. This time, I'll focus on the Wooded Kingdom. This is a mid-game level, so you're comfortable with the game mechanic. This is one of the biggest kingdoms. It has a similar feel to Hollow Knight, where you first go through a fairly linear path and then unlock all the kingdom to fully explore it. In this case, you explore a bit, solve a riddle and move to a platform with a button, defeat some plants and go to a boss arena. But in this game, all abilities are unlocked from the start, so how do you guide the player? Mario uses rocks to block paths or doors, and also blocks an enemy until you complete the story so some places are inaccessible. This makes the player focus on what you want, but it feels too gamey. Also, there's the deep woods, which you access by falling to most bits in the level. This is one of the most hated parts, as it's very annoying to navigate and live. The level is based in verticality, so you always go up or down. It's very dense in trees, but also in visible places, so you never really get close in the forest. Alright, this is also quite the feat. A reward almost everywhere, so you always got him, man, I got a moon! After beating the game, yeah, man, maybe this moon opens up the next area, part. I don't know. So you get Congratulations, Mario. Back in the middle. Got him. Enough of your poison personality. Waboom, baby. I got a triple uh, moon. I still need three more to power the ship. But like I said, I'm going to proceed with the storyline however it wants me to. I'm going to try to do all the main content of the area before moving forward. I want... Four, you can make an area. Be big, but always have places to visit or rewards to collect. Big does not mean empty. Five, you can make an area fresh again by making more challenges after you beat the game. 6. Even the decoration can be used as a gimmick, like this moon on top of the room. 
In conclusion, we'll review some of the ideas and explain which are the most important, as well as explain some of the details.